Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 64. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Good day to you, Dr. Woolman. Good day to you, Christina, and greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. Dr. Glenn Woolman, and I'll be your host and medical guide, along with Christina, as we travel today through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, searching for optimal health. And we are very fortunate again today to have with us Tracy Harrison, who is um, a wellness and nutrition coach and health coach, and her purpose is to teach people how to eat with purpose. Uh, Christina, how about telling our guests how to get in touch with us today? Thank you, Glenn. Uh, So at any time during this live presentation, you can feel free to ask your question or make your comment by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Or if you prefer, you can dial into our conference line, 323-476-3672, and your ID is 607-393-POUND. And if that went by a little too fast, not to worry, it will be on our screen during the show. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome, and thank you. Uh, And today, as I said, we're going to have uh, another wonderful conversation, I'm sure, with uh, Tracy Harrison, who I repeat, is a health and wellness coach. Uh, In order to learn a little bit about Tracy, I would suggest that you uh, review episode 53. And then we did another episode where we took a tour of the gastrointestinal tract. And as you remember, we went from the mouth to the anus. And that was episode 59. So if you want to learn about that, I would say check those out. But for the meantime, let's spend the rest of the day with... uh, Tracy. Hello, Tracy. How are you? I am well today, Glenn. Thanks so much. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to uh, be chatting with you again. I (laughs) keep looking forward to these. Each time I uh, review some of the older ones, I I get more and more excited. I love listening to your (laughs) uh, knowledge and way of putting things in a simple way, but it makes such great sense. Absolutely. Well, hello, Tracy. Welcome back. (laughs) Hi, Christina. Thanks. I'm delighted to be back. This is a lot of fun. It is fun. It's especially fun to have you here. So let's uh, dive in. (laughs) Yeah. So today, as always, I like to, as the medical guide, give a little bit of direction to our viewers. And again, I hope that if some of you have some questions, write in, call in with the numbers that you were given earlier. So today, Tracy, I think what I want to do is, since it's a magical medical tour, I want to keep on the tour theme. And I would like to, for the first, maybe first part of the show, I'd like to talk about food, how it is out in the field, and things we should know about what happens from the field to the market. And the second part, I want to talk about the market what you should look for in a market, how to read labels, whether you should go to organic markets or any market is okay, and a number of other things that in our free-range discussion today, maybe we'll uh, have an opportunity to look at. And finally, I want to talk about uh, taking the food from the market uh, to the house and getting it ready for your mouth. So we'll talk a little bit about preparation. I And I know that a lot of people are getting more and more interested in nutrition and doing a lot of research. So I, I think, Tracy, you'll probably come up with some things that we don't normally talk about. How's that sound for you? Sounds great. Let's go. That'll be a whirlwind tour. <laughs> It'll be a whirlwind tour because as, as we've learned with you, every topic that we speak about, we could do an entire year's worth of shows. So let's at least... <laughs> I know. I have to be managed, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we have to be in little in little bite-sized increments, so to speak. <laughs> so let's start, let's yeah, start let's out... Let's see if and... we can give people some... I was going to say just some tidbits today. I, I have a number uh, of uh, small, succinct tidbits that I'm hoping will be really helpful to the viewers. Yeah, we're staying clearly in a... Uh, nutritional metaphor. So I hope that goes right through the whole show. So we're let's go out to the field. And in the fields, many things are happening. You know, we have plant-based uh, food products and we have animal-based uh, food products. So what should we be thinking about in terms of what's happening in the field 
of the things that we're learning how to eat? I, I think one of the most important things uh, for folks to consider uh, about um, food in general is that it is going to have the most nutrition um, if the if it's a plant food, if it's been allowed to really fully ripen in the field um, as um, a piece of fruit or a, a, a vegetable um, becomes slightly ripe. Um, if, Farmers are very quick to pick it um, when it's not quite ripe in order to put it on a truck or a plane and ship it thousands of miles with the assumption that it will ripen in transit. And um, in principle, that's true. But unfortunately, because that food was picked early, it's gonna, not going to have anywhere near as much nutrition as it would if it had been left to fully ripen. And so as a result, trying to get your food as soon as possible after it's been picked and allowing it to remain on the vine or on the stalk or on the tree as long as possible is the way to maximize the nutrients you get in your food. And uh, as such, I think uh, an important tenet is to really try and take advantage of local food, um, not only because I think it's great for communities supporting each other, but in principle, food that you get locally was probably harvested in just the one, two, three days before you purchased it as opposed to food that was harvested in a cross country or across the world um, that was packed in crates and may have spent several weeks uh, in transport. So I think timing uh, is really key, Glenn, as a, as a first concept. Can I, before you go on, I know that if, if I go out and buy eggs, they have things on them that say, uh, this, is, this is when you should eat them by, or this is when you should sell them by. Uh, how do we know that about fruit other than if we went to a farmer's market? Is there a way? Because not everyone does go to a farmer's market. Some people go to the normal markets that most of us grew up with. Is there any way on the fruits when they're in the produce department that they can, they can tell that something has been freshly picked? Or do they have to ask their grocer? Or is it just a game? Well, I, I guess um, there's a little bit of a game for sure. I, I think a couple of things that I often recommend to my clients is to smell the food. It should smell robust and delicious. It should have an aroma and certainly not smell like plastic or have no scent at all um, as it ripens uh, fruit, but vegetables as well. But uh, in particular, fruit takes on this delightfully sweet, appetizing aroma that'll probably make your mouth water. Mm. Um, the other thing you can do is look for the little identifying sticker. Uh, these days on all fruits and vegetables, there will be some type of little sticker that has uh, a number, uh, a scan number for uh, the checkout register, but it will also have the country of origin. And, and obviously 10 to 1, if food was picked in your country, as opposed to here in the States from Australia or Italy or Chile, um, it was definitely picked quite some time ago. And so trying to, to pick things as close to home as possible is a value. Uh, and then, of course, you certainly want to look at what you're purchasing and make sure that isn't, it isn't beginning to show signs of mold, um, little white spots or um, really soft, uh, foul-smelling brown spots. Uh, that's definitely an indication that the food has been sitting too long. Tracy, you, you just brought up something uh, that came to me as interesting in our technological world today. When the fruits have these stickers on them with a scan number, do people have apps that they can use that will go over that scan and give them information like they do in other products? Do you know? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Uh, very few things in the produce area actually have a, a barcode uh, or anything that would be readable by a handheld device. Most of them just have numbers. Uh, at this point, um, that a cashier would actually be typing in. Uh, and a little tidbit for those of you who may not be aware is that for the vast, vast majority of produce, the numbers are either going to start with a four or a nine. Uh, and a nine is an indication of organic produce, and a, a four is not organic produce. So sometimes items get mixed together in bins. That's how you can tell. Um, those stickers are actually put on the product um, at the, the farm or at the, um, the, the distribution point, not in the store. Uh, so that's a, a way to identify them. But I think freshness is really important for not just flavor, but for nutrition and, and nutrient density in food. So I'm a big fan of supporting your local farmers, taking advantage of local farmers' markets, uh, 
especially this time of year. They tend to be busting with options. And many times you can save quite a bit of money um, by, um, by opting for those, um, those types of markets as well. I have a uh, question. What about um, bananas? Because most of the bananas I find, of course, are either from Mexico or Ecuador or somewhere in South America. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and some people say, well, it doesn't matter if it's organic or not organic because there's a skin or a peel on it. Uh, yeah, help us, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll say right off the bat that I'm a very big believer in buying as much organic food as you can find and as you can afford, understanding that both of those are significant limiters, depending on where you live, what your economic means are, and, um, and what's available um, in, a, in a given season. Um, bananas, uh, we, we, in the U.S., we will find it virtually impossible to purchase truly tree-ripened bananas. A little known fact is that um, if a banana has been allowed to fully ripen on the tree, it will be fully cylindrical. It will not have kind of squarish edges. And the vast, vast majority of bananas that you will find in stores, um, in markets in the U.S., are going to have those squarish edges, which is just an indication that they were picked very green and then uh, transported uh, oh. in order to ripen in transport. Um, uh, the difference in, um, organic standards for, um, bananas beyond pesticide spraying, um, on the, the food is the, the types of gases that are put into the bags with bananas in order to either speed or retard ripening, uh, in transit. And, uh, contrary to common myth, the, uh, those gases are absorbed, um, through the peeling of, um, of bananas. That is a porous, obviously the, mm -hmm. the plant has to get, um, oxygen. Um, and, uh, so there is absorption. Uh, so even though there's a thick skin, uh, there's still value in choosing organic where possible. Wow. That, that's a really good point because, uh, I, I think most of us didn't know that there were gases pumped into those bags for shipment. Yeah, they'll put uh, uh, literally hundreds of bunches in a giant bag together um, for transport. Uh, and uh, we love having bananas year-round, but by definition, they're a tropical fruit. So un unless you live in deep Southern California, uh, where it might have just come over the border fairly close mm -hmm. to home, uh, it's going to be a, a fairly long-distance transport mm -hmm. for the vast mm -hmm. majority of folks in the U.S. Or if you live in Hawaii. Boy, have you or if tried? Or you live in Hawaii? Oh, those have you ever wild been to bananas! A banana farm? <laughs> no, I, I've never <laughs> been to. They're delicious. Oh, they're oh. exquisite. The the flavor, Christine, is amazing. Amazing, they are so sweet, and they're almost uh, citrusy, aren't they? I mean, the ones that we've yes. had, which is you know, they're they're we have many friends in Hawaii, and they have their wild mango and wild banana trees in their backyard. Well, I can't stop eating them. I mean, it's like I could yes. eat 20 because they're not very big. And interestingly yes. enough, they are round, which I just thought was the variety. Yeah. I didn't realize it was because they were, you know, picked very young and packaged, et cetera, that, that gives them that square or hard edge shape. But, oh, yeah. my God. And the skin is very thin. Yes, the skin is very thin. The plant's naturally preparing for the fruit to be consumed by somebody in, in hopes of uh, furthering itself as a plant, right? Mm. There's wisdom in nature. Um, but I want to really highlight something you just said. If you've never had a truly tree-ripened uh, peach or um, ripe right off the vine uh, mm. berry, there is a flavor richness that you just can't come close to uh, in fruit that was picked a couple of weeks ago and, and transported. Mm -hmm. um, a real, not just a, um, a sweeter taste, and as I mentioned, a higher nutrient density, a measurably higher nutrient density, but much more enjoyment. Uh, I appreciate that we can't really do that year round. We're not really set up seasonally for fruit to be in season 12 months out of the year. Um, but I, um, when it is available, I think it's really worth uh, investing in because it's a real pleasure and, and joy in life. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and it, it, uh, the situation here in California, you know, they, it ripens very fast and you, we tend not to refrigerate the fruit. But once it gets ripe to a certain point, then that's when you freeze it. And you make your smoothies and ice cream and popsicles mm. <laughs> by blending it all up. It's just 
magnificent. You can use it basically year round because I have taken very ripe fruit and frozen it, you know, so that I could yes. have it in the summer months. It's very sim similar to canning the fruit, except, yes. right? Uh, so we, exactly. we deep freeze it Let's, in um, bags. L let's talk about that, Christine. I'm really glad you, glad you brought it up because I think freezing is a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of produce when it's at its ripest and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, freezing locks in nutrients and food. And uh, in fact, Glenn and I were chatting the other day about um, the fact that when when food is off season or when it doesn't look particularly fresh or high quality in the market, you're much better off actually purchasing frozen food, which many mm. times is is less expensive. And most of it is uh, frozen very close to the location of harvest. Um, that's what what keeps it from um, from perishing. And so that's a great way to save some money. And certainly uh, during the summer, I will go on a, an extravaganza of berry picking when they're cheap and delicious and ripe, so flavorful. Yeah. And I'll buy 10 pounds of berries and freeze them and then take advantage of them for, um, for smoothies or snacking throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great strategy. Mm -hmm. I think many mm -hmm. people could take advantage of that when they find deals uh, in the market or in a farmer's market this summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to stay still out in the field a little bit more before we get to the market. Keep I told you, guys, you I was going to detour. No. Keep, keep you guys under some control here before we start going to the kitchen. Uh, when we're talking, we're talking about the plant-based and fruit-based, and certainly we need to have at least one moment of genetically modified uh, foods. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I do. And I have to be managed on this topic, Glenn. I will um, manage you. So, <laughs> so let's talk about, first of all, what, what GMO, what genetically modified food means, because I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, hybridization is a natural process where nature uh, naturally provides for survival of the fittest. Uh, and farmers for millennia have used the notion of hybridizing, where you cross maybe a, a berry that has good mold resistance with a berry that has particularly good flavor in hopes of getting a berry that has both. You take a berry and cross it with a berry, and hopefully you get a better berry. Um, this is something that farmers have used purposefully, but also something that is natural. Uh, genetic modification involves crossing, essentially, a plant with a bacteria or a virus or a, another microbe. And so what you end up with is a very unnatural set of genes. And, you know, when we eat food and it goes down into our GI tract, like we talked about last time, one of the most important things that happens right off the bat is it gets examined by our immune system. Uh, I don't think we talked last time about the fact that um, three quarters, almost three quarters of our immune system is in our guts. And we have um, immune cells that are constantly uh, sampling and sniffing and surveilling what we've consumed, trying to decide, is this a food or is this a foreign invader? Is, is, this, is this safe and calm or is this a threat? Do I need to attack? Do I need to become inflamed and activated? And what we have learned, and I believe is indisputable in the medical research at this point, is that for some percentage of the population, um, our immune systems do recognize the genes of genetically modified foods as being foreign. Because in nature, you will not find um, a plant crossed genetically with a microbe. That, that doesn't exist. We don't have those kind of crazy creatures in our environment. And as such, if uh, our immune system is sensitive to that, it will identify the food as a foreign invader and eating the food will cause inflammation. And what we found in clinical research is that this can ex exacerbate symptoms of asthma, allergy, or other atopy, uh, as well as um, manifestation of autoimmune disease. So while it doesn't affect everyone in the population, I think it's um, something we really need to start paying attention to in terms of mucking with Mother Nature too much, because we have a very well-honed immune system that has protected us from dying out for millennia. And that immune system is very good at sniffing out what's not right, what's not natural. 
And um, immune system activation is the primary cause of inflammation in the body, which can manifest as anything from headaches to eczema to chronic postnasal drip to arthritis. Uh, or even worse. So uh, I am a big believer in trying to avoid genetically modified foods, but unfortunately with the current state of GMO labeling in the US, the only way you can be absolutely sure that you're not getting um, genetically modified food is to purchase it organic. Um, the organic standard, at least in principle, does not allow genetically modified foods. Uh, there's all sorts of grassroots projects, the GMO project and, and similar um, outlets that are trying to certify foods as being GMO free. And um, as we learned from the, um, the proposed legislation in California, even last year, right on your home turf over there, um, very, very close to passage that are a lot of people are concerned about GMOs in their food. You know, it's interesting for me, uh, the controversy about the GMO food, genetically modified, because as I'm seeing this, I'm also watching in medicine right now where we're learning about the genome, the genetics of the body. And as we learn more about the genome, it's going to be related to how we look at health and illness and treatments. So we're already starting to recognize, for example, genes that may have a tendency toward heart disease or diabetes or cerebral palsy or uh, Parkinson's disease. And one of our first concerns is what's going to happen if we really know that and the insurance agencies come out and they say, well, looks like you're <laughs> going to have a history of a heart attack uh, sometime, so we're not going to insure you. But what's even more interesting to me is that in the future, we're going to have the opportunity to actually modify genes in ourselves. So if you have an opportunity to uh, know that you may get Parkinson's disease at some point, would you consider having your genetics modified to uh, avoid that Parkinson's? And then we're going to be genetically modified organisms. So I think this is going to be fascinating I, uh, to watch. Yeah. Now, in, in fact, that's a great topic for another show, protecting your DNA. Glenn, let's write that one down. I, like that. Um, I'm not, I promise it. I won't go there right now, although I'm itching to. That's a great topic, um, and I agree with you completely. The next decade in particular is going to be fascinating in that arena medically. Mm. Let's talk uh, for one more moment about, we've talked about the plants and the fruits. Anything about the animals out in the field that you want to uh, give us some tidbits on? <laughs> Yes, um, you just said it yourself. The animals should actually be in the field. Um, most people would be shocked to know that the vast majority of livestock raised in the U.S., at least for food, never see the light of day, um, much less a field. Um, they're, they're raised in dark barns and crates or cages um, or stalls. And I, um, I believe very strongly in the value of trying to... Uh, Choose, again, where it's available, where you can afford it, but really moving in the direction of choosing grass-fed, free-range, pastured, wild foods. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, I'm, I personally, the ethical treatment of animals is, a, is an important priority for me just as a person. And, and whether it is for everyone else or not, we know that when animals are allowed to eat their natural environment, the foods that we take from them are more nutrient dense. My favorite example of that is in grass-fed beef, for example, um, or, or pastured um, uh, animal meats. We actually find the, the critically important essential omega-3 fats, and, and that's because the the animal gets them from grass, just like a, a salmon in the wild, a salmon fish, um, gets it from the seaweed that the fish is consuming. Um, when we take animals out of their natural environment, like a farm-raised salmon or grain-fed uh, cows, in both cases, what they're being fed is corn, usually corn that's been soaked in high fructose corn syrup for extra calories. And corn is not a natural diet for a fish or for a cow. And it's one of the reasons why we end up having to feed so many medications um, to animals in order to keep them disease free um, so that they don't get illness or die early on an unnatural diet. 
Um, but we get more nutrition from the food when the food is from an animal that's been allowed to live naturally and eat its own natural food. Uh, cows are designed in nature to eat grass and bugs and hay and weeds and wildflowers. And that diet conveys an incredible um, richness of nutrients uh, in the food. Yeah. Um, grass, grass-fed butter. It's another one of my favorite examples. Grass-fed butter is very rich in uh, vitamin K, which is absolutely critical for keeping calcium in the right place in the body. Right? We want calcium in our bones, not lining our arteries and not in, our, not in kidney stones. Um, vitamin K controls a lot of that. Significant amounts of vitamin K found in grass-fed butter, typically vitamin K in grain-fed conventional butter, zero. Um, very different nutrient profile in the more naturally raised foods than um, in the um, factory farm uh, type of environment. I'm sorry to uh, say this, but I keep having this uh, vision of butter out there grazing on grass. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about that, Glenn. I Maybe you need to eat more of it. <laughs> I, I have to be, uh, I have to admit, I haven't seen any butter labeled as such. So if oh, it's yes. organic um, butter. Grass fed. Grass fed. Really? Now it may or may not be organic, but it can still be grass fed. Hmm. Um, it may be labeled as pastured. It may be labeled as free range. Um, they, these are all uh, terms that don't have explicit legal definitions, but it essentially means animals that have been allowed to have some amount of time outdoors and some amount of time on pasture wow. um, or free ranging in the external environment. Um, it really does make a difference, though, in terms of the quality of the food um, mm -hmm. that we get in the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've covered a little bit of from the field to the market. Of course, as we all know, we could speak for hours on each. And clearly, by watching the two of you uh, chatting about a banana, I think we could, <laughs> <laughs> we could uh, continue on that. But I want to move into the market and talk about. Uh, maybe we can talk about the difference between a regular market and, or, and a farmer's market. But I also want to really spend some time on teaching uh, some of our viewers some of the secret things that are on labels and what would be helpful to us to look for in reading a label and making the choice of whether something remains in the market or it moves back to our house. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I, I think a basic tip, Glenn, that I love to share uh, with my clients about um, the grocery store is uh, pretty much across the board, you can make your diet healthier and more, nu more nutrient dense by shopping in the periphery of the grocery store and spending and, and purchasing fewer foods that are up and down the aisles in the middle. And that's because for the most part, the perishable, the natural, the whole foods are in the periphery of the, the grocery store, whether it's fruit or vegetables or seafood or meats or dairy foods, eggs. Um, this is what takes us around the periphery of the store, uh, as opposed to the processed, refined, uh, good for the next three years because it's had preservatives added, boxed jarred, packaged things in the center of the store. It's a real simple tip, but to think about spending more of our dollars, uh, more of our time in the periphery of the store. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of food choices overall. Wait, I have to I, interrupt. Um, I have to interrupt for okay, one sure. moment and say, that was good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking now of budgeting as you walk into a store and say, I'm going to budget three quarters of my uh, food money for the periphery and a quarter for the uh, central portion. Well, I, I have to say I'm very happy because my wine is also on the periphery. <laughs> I, was, I was going to mention that. It's squeezed but grapes, I... fermented grapes is good. <laughs> That's great. That's funny. Christina, uh, representing every person. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Oh, my. Okay, that was great, you know, Glenn, but that, that's not going to get you away from your health tip at the end because that was such a good tip, but let's okay, continue. Okay, no, I have a different health tip. No worries. 
Um, I, um, but to answer your question, I, and, and I, I am not the food police. I don't believe in being over the top rigid about food. Uh, when for me personally, and for the people I support, I try to think about having the anchoring 90% of my diet being whole natural food. Um, and the other 10%, um, can pretty much be what you want it to be. I, I think we need to have space in our diet for treats and indulgences and, um, engaging in, you know, the food culture in our society. And, and so the 90, 10 split I find is sustainable by the vast majority of people. And it's, it's the core of our diet that's really going to determine our wellness, not nitpicking the heck out of every single solitary bite that enters our mouths. Um, that makes me feel neurotic and, uh, you know, teases me out a little bit. Uh, we don't need to be uh, that overly focused on every morsel, but really on ensuring the quality of that anchoring 90%. Um, and, and Michael Pollan is uh, the food um, scientist, editor, um, speaker, is famous for his um, quote of encouraging people to eat food, not food-like substances. And, and I think there's a lot of food found in the periphery of the store and a lot of food-like substances found in the center of it. Yeah, he also said, um, eat less food. And uh, what was the last one? Oh, mainly vegetables. I think that was the four tenets that he talks about. Eat food, eat yes. real food, he eat says, less. Did you... Uh, he says... To, um, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say the quote is, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Right. Yeah. I want to go back for a second. Did you say that uh, obsessing over every bite cheeses you out? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, life is too short to have these kind of neuroses. Uh, I think there has to be some wiggle room for some fun and some spontaneity. And, you know, you go to a restaurant and maybe they don't have, they don't have searingly healthy items on the menu. Minus be forcing yourself to eat something you might be allergic to or have a real intolerance to. Um, you do the best you can and move on um, because there's so much else to savor about a meal, the environment, the quiet time, um, community, fun with friends and family. Um, there's, there's actually a labeled syndrome today called orthorexia. Um, which is uh, about getting overly neurotic about your food. Um, so I just think we need a little bit of balance in there. We pay attention to that core and then allow ourselves a little bit of freedom. Um, I, I just but, thought uh, that it was getting, interesting. Getting back to the market. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, though, that you picked a food metaphor for a way of obsessing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> uh, let's move on to let's move on to some labels and talking about reading labels. I think more and more people are becoming label conscious, but what are some of the things that we really need to focus on? We could spend an hour on each uh, label trying to read it and understand it. What are some of the simple things that will give us a hint right away that this is good, take it home or leave it here? It, so um uh, Segovia, if you can help us with uh, um, some graphics, we have um, a, a nutrition label for some yogurt, a um, little white label with uh, blue print, and we'll try to bring that up. Um, so hopefully you can see that. This is a classic nutrition label, and I'm a very big fan of reading labels. Um, but the thing that I tend to pay attention to the most is the ingredient list. I think it's very important that everything in an ingredient list look and sound like a food to you because um, while there can be an awful lot of misleading marketing and advertisement, um, colorful labels and pop themes on the front of a package, for the most part, manufacturers are forced to tell you the truth on the back. Um, two things that I want to call out here on nutrition facts for yogurt. If you do well with fermented or with dairy foods, then yogurt can be a very healthy food. But um, you can see here, uh, this is for uh, fat-free blueberry yogurt. I want you to notice that there are 19 grams of sugar in this one little container of yogurt. I'm a very big fan of yogurt, but I think we all should be buying plain yogurt and then putting in it what we want to have in it. Because guaranteed, if you purchase your own and you put some fruit in it, or maybe even a spoonful or two of honey, 
you are not going to have the sum total be 19 grams of sugar. There are four grams of sugar in a teaspoon, uh, Glenn. And so uh, 19 grams is the equivalent of almost five teaspoons of sugar. That is uh, slightly less than a couple of candy bars. Food manufacturers know that the more sugar you put in foods, the more addictive um, you can make them. And uh, yogurt is in appe increasingly appealing to children because it's so super sweet. Viewers may find it interesting that the American Heart Association, conservative though it is, I believe, has actually started to recommend maximum intake of supplemental sugars and a healthy diet. And for a, a full grown adult woman, they recommend um, no more than six teaspoons of sugar. Uh, and for a full grown man, no more than nine. Certainly for a child, it would be much, much less than that, um, depending on their weight and their age. But with 19 grams of sugar in one little yogurt container, this is almost all of what a full grown woman should be consuming in an entire day. We haven't looked at any other food or beverages yet. Um, there is, um, on average, about four or five grams that come naturally in yogurt as a result of the lactose or the milk sugar that would come in the yogurt. But the rest of it is added. And you can see that although this is blueberry-flavored yogurt, there's quite a bit of, obviously, sugar and fructose that has also been added in order to cook, kick up the sweetness um, of this particular food. So very important, I think, to pay attention to the amount of sugar and, and also the serving size. In this particular case, a serving is a whole container. But uh, folks would be surprised to learn just how many beverages. One bottle is not one serving. One bottle might be one and a half or two or two and a half or even three servings. Um, and shocked to find out that they're getting 50, 60, 70 grams of sugar in one beverage. So I think paying attention to the serving size and the sugar grams is a great place to start because amongst all the other ingredients, I really believe strongly that sugar is the biggest nemesis. Sugar and sweeteners is the biggest nemesis in the modern diet. I, uh, I have so many experiences with that. I, I was looking at a cereal once and they were touting it as a blueberry cereal. Uh, or it had blueberries in it. And of course, everyone is on the antioxidant craze. So anything that says if it has blueberries, then it's got to be excellent for you. So I, I looked at it. And when I went to the nutritional things and the ingredients, I looked and it said amount of blueberries, zero. Yeah. So it was, it was labeled as a blueberry. It had blueberries in it, but the amount of blueberries were zero. Now I, also, in doing some of my reading, I actually wrote a blog on this that you can find on my website. But I saw that, and I want to hear your opinion on this. The government has made it so that if, a, if an amount of an ingredient is less than a certain amount, then they don't have to add it as, mm. as an amount. They can call it zero. So as a fake example, if arsenic was in a box of cookies, in every cookie, so you talk about the serving well, a serving of cookies is one cookie, right? So, but nobody would eat just one cookie. And if you look at, it would say the amount of arsenic was less than the amount that they had to uh, register it. So they could call it zero. But if you eat one cookie, you'll make it very little arsenic. But if you eat 12 cookies, like most of us do, then, uh, or at least myself, uh, <laughs> I can't. I mean, I'm in that 10 percent range right now. Uh, then they will be getting a lot more. And it's it's a sense of false advertising. What's your take on that? And what's your thinking of how we figure that out? What you said is absolutely true. There are, there are a huge number of additives, actually, flavor enhancers, consistency enhancers, preservatives that don't have to be declared at all. They're just considered to be, um, I believe, the phrase is part of the manufacturing standard. Um, and, and that's the case of any and all products, uh, which is a big concern for a number of people who do have specific allergies or sensitivities. Uh, it can be very hard to flesh out where they might be hiding. Um, but I want to use your comment, Glenn. Actually, I, we didn't plan this, but it's a great uh, segue. Um, so, Gobi, if we can bring up the, um, the other, not the granola bar, but the other example of um, nutrition label and ingredient okay. list. Yes, exactly. I want to show you the nutrient label. This is for Coffee Mate. Um, and uh, I use this as a, um, a uh, 
uh, an advertisement here for an ingredient that I really think all of us need to completely and totally avoid in our food. And that's what you see right up here in the third ingredient, partially hydrogenated oils. Um, the only way that you can reliably know whether there is trans fats in a product is to look at the ingredient list and see if you see the phrase partially hydrogenated. Um, these are modif um, synthetically modified fats. Um, it's really the rearrangement of hydrogen atoms on a fatty acid chain. But the more important thing is these fats, when they're incorporated into cell membranes, cause cellular dysfunction and the ability for nutrients to diffuse into the cell and for toxins to be escorted out. And in fact, trans fats are the only type of fats that have really been shown directly to contribute to the buildup of atherosclerotic plaque in, in uh, arteries, which uh, sets the primary foundation for um, heart disease. But look at the, look at the um, nutrition facts table here, Glenn. Obviously, there is trans fats in it because we can see the trans fats, right? Partially hydrogenated soybean and or cottonseed oil. But if we look over at the label on the left, it says trans fats, zero grams. And the current state of FDA mandate is that if a serving size has a half a gram of trans fats or less per serving, then companies are allowed to round to zero and say zero, which to your point, I mean, I'm a, I'm a scientist by background, so I admit I'm a little exacting, but that's lying because there is trans fats in this. And, and if it were something I only ate once in a blue moon, maybe I wouldn't care so much. But an awful lot of things that are trans fat laden are substances that people are consuming every day, perhaps multiple times. And um, I really don't believe trans fats um, are one of those everything in moderation kinds of foods. I encourage all of my clients to avoid them 100%. Um, but unless you're looking at the ingredient list, you could easily be misled, just as you described. We cannot go off of the numbers in terms of grams because a, a lot of monkeying around is legally allowed at this point. The ingredient list is the, the place we can find the closest to the truth at this point. Um, but I really feel like we should be avoiding all trans fats in our food. I think Coffee Mate and similar kind of artificial coffee creamers are very toxic. If people want a creamer in their coffee, then they should just use cream or half and half or something similar. Uh, at least it's natural um, as opposed to a, a huge combination of chemicals here, as you can see, chemicals, water, sugar, and trans fats. That's a pretty toxic cocktail. When you're yeah, it is pretty toxic. When you're um, looking at the ingredient list, does the order have anything to do with importance or is it alphabetical or how, does the order matter when we look at an ingredient list? It does. The order, Glenn, is starts with the most um, prominent ingredient. So, for example, here in Coffee Mate, um, the, the primary ingredient, the one that is most represented in volume, uh, would be water, followed by sugar, followed by um, trans fats. Um, so when, when things you don't want to consume in particular uh, appear way near the top of the list, that's an indication that they're pretty prominent in the mix. Uh, in fact, um, if we can bring up the third ingredient list, this is for uh, some granola bars. One of the things I want to draw your attention to is, is taking a look at what's in here. Um, when we think about a granola bar, what do most people think of? Right, Christina, when you think of a granola bar, what do you expect to be in it? Oh, oatmeal and nuts and dried fruit. A little honey. Okay, there we go. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Oatmeal and nuts. Um, would be the primary ingredients. If I were to make granola or granola bar from scratch, that's what I would use. But in this case, if you take a look at the ingredients um, here, hopefully you can see this. We have oh peanuts, first of all, which is great. But then the next two ingredients are high maltose corn syrup, which is a sweetener, followed by sugar. <laughs> then we come to oats. There's actually more corn syrup and more sugar in this product than there is oats. Mm. which really should be alarming to us in terms of the ratio of the ingredients. I, am I eating a sweetened granola bar or am I eating an oaty sugar bar? Um, <laughs> those are, are two different things. 
Um, in fact, if you look at this ingredient list, there's mm -hmm. not just two. There's actually six different sweeteners in here. What is the difference um, between the high maltose corn syrup as opposed to the, what, uh, Segovia, can you bring that back? As opposed to the high fructose corn syrup. And then there is another fructose down the line. <laughs> what yes, is the difference between them? <laughs> well, first of all, anything that ends in an OS, an OSE is a sugar. And uh, that's an important thing for people to realize in looking at a label because food manufacturers are trying really hard to... Um, uh, I think sometimes disguise ingredients. Um, they're given the negative press about high fructose corn syrup. They're working desperately to get high fructose corn syrup out of the top line of the ingredient list. Um, a lot of people will just look at the first couple of ingredients and assume that if more toxic things fall further down the list, it's okay. Uh, and in this case, the use of high maltose corn syrup is one of those strategies. It's still a sweetener. It's still a high glycemic food. It's still going to cause a pretty tremendous spike in blood sugar. Requires little to no digestion in order to be absorbed in the gut. Um, so when, when we have these kind of refined sweeteners in foods, um, they are a major contributor to a high glycemic response or an aggressive blood sugar response to a food that may make people feel energetic quickly for the first hour, but it's going to cause a, a consequential slump or the sugar blues, you probably heard of those, um, a slump in energy later on. Um, usually about two to three hours later when people start looking for yet another snack. Um, it's one of the primary reasons why people tend to have an energy, um, an energy trough or a, a crash around 2.30 in the afternoon because they had a nice high glycemic lunch and they're crashing from the blood sugar spike. Um, so, sorry, long answer to your question, but these are all sweeteners. Um, maltose is just a different type of sugar. Um, it has a different, um, it, it's a different molecular structure than, uh, fructose, um, that affects some people a little more aggressively, some people a little less aggressively, but it's still a refined sweetener. Oh, well, keep those okay, out of Christina? the cupboard. Hmm? Pardon me? Are you, are you, are you okay? <laughs> oh, I, that's amazing. I mean, I, I haven't read that label because it's very hard to find. Uh, you hardly see that brand out here recently. So I haven't even read those labels and it's like, wow. <laughs> well, so true. Let's, let's move further down the list though, right? Because... I mean, it gets better uh, or worse, um, I guess, uh, or sad. More exciting. Why we... <laughs> we, have, we have to make Why sure we before, have... you, before you give us any information, we, we have to make sure that Christina can handle this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, luckily, we don't, we don't consume it, but it, it's just, uh, uh, you know, to see the high... I've, I've seen the fructose with the sugar on many labels. And, you know, of course, I pick and choose even what I reach for at the market. But to actually see a label where there is like all the different types of sugars and all the different ways and variations that they're labeling it is, is oh, horrifying. Sure. <laughs> we have high maltose corn syrup. We have sugar. We have high fructose corn syrup. Yes. Further down, we have sugar again. We have malt, um, which is also a sweetener. We have sugar again. We have fructose again. Um, this is a way in which uh, manufacturers are able to kind of disperse the sugars, if you will, amongst um, all of the ingredients. So maybe they don't look quite so um, intimidating, mm. but make no mistake, this is a very highly sweetened food. Uh, unfortunately, it also apparently needs to be artificially colored. Uh, why in the world we would need to color a granola bar, I have no idea. Um, but I wanted to just point this out. Um, uh, down here uh, on the list, um, we have artificial yellow and red and blue um, <laughs> coloring. Um, this is just an example of chemicals in our food that we don't need. Um, are they there in minuscule amounts? Absolutely. But the problem is that the average American's diet is having minuscule amounts in dozens of foods every day. And day after day after day, that builds up. Uh, especially if it's foods that maybe are a standard part of our diet and part of that anchoring 90% rather than an exception food um, that just comes, comes around once in a blue moon. Mm. Um, so, and I, I think in general, you can really uh, 
tell whether a food is natural and whole in many ways based on how many ingredients it has. I encourage people to think about not purchasing any processed foods that have more than about six ingredients. Um, because we just don't need foods to be this highly refined. It's very straightforward actually to follow a simple recipe and make your own granola bars. You can make about 60 of them at once and freeze them and save a tremendous amount of money, skip the chemicals and eat them, defrosting them a batch at a time, eat them over three months. Um, I'm a very big fan of cook once and then eat many times. I'm preparing things in volume. Sorry, Glenn, I'm going from the market to the home here, but uh, I think it's well, a great strategy to save yes, time. It, it's a good segue. Uh, if there's nothing else in the market that you want to talk about, we can move to the kitchen right now. Did you want to cover anything else quickly and then move to the kitchen or segue right into it? No, I think that's good. Let's uh, let's talk about the kitchen for a minute. I do have okay. a couple of tidbits. Um, right. So let's talk about that. We've now decided... <clears throat> we've checked out the foods in the fields and we've got them to the right market and we've picked out things in the periphery and all the good things. Now we're bringing them into the kitchen, getting very close to our mouths right now. So what are some of the things that we should do in the kitchen? Well, <clears throat> I, like I said, I'm, I'm a very big fan of a, a commitment to my health and my family's health is spending some time in the kitchen doing something other than microwaving processed foods. Uh, I know that there's some people who really dislike cooking, but if you're going to eat healthily, someone, whether it's you or a family member or someone you hire, someone is going to have to be doing at least a little bit of cooking. Um, but you know, I'm a, I'm obviously a, a real foodie and I love cooking and I still don't want to do it every night. I got other things to do. I got a lot of hobbies and a lot of fun things going on. So I will very frequently triple or quadruple a recipe and then enjoy leftovers in the following, say, three days for, um, for a different meal, just to take advantage of the time I put into preparing it. Uh, so I really encourage people to do the same. And if you're going to make stir fry, don't just make enough for one meal, make enough for multiple meals. So uh, before, you, before to, you move um, forward. Uh, before you move forward on that, I wanted to ask you a very quick question about preparing uh, three times as much and saving it. Uh, in some of the work that I read about, we talk about leaky gut syndrome, where people are eating the same thing over and over and over again. So when we make something or when you make something, uh, do you have the leftover for the next two or three or four days, or do you spread it out so that it, you're not eating the same thing? Or is that not as important as what I'm thinking? Well, I, uh, both. Um, so oh, my typical routine, not that Tracy's, Tracy's regimen is magic by any means, but on a typical Sunday, I'm going to make three dishes. Nice Sunday afternoon. I'm not under pressure. I can turn on some music, have a glass of wine or a cup of tea. It's fun. Um, I'll prepare maybe three different dishes that then to your point, I'll be rotating through, um, and enjoying, um, uh, in uh, for different meals, usually lunches and dinners, over the next three, maybe four days. So it's not just one dish. I obviously okay. like some variety. Um, but I think the, the the more important thing about something like leaky gut and, and overexposure to a single food is that every Sunday, I don't make the exact same things. I'm changing it up. And and I think that's a, that's a fine window of diversity in the diet. It's not that every meal or every day has to be different. It's trying to keep us from ruts so that we're not making chicken and broccoli stir fry every Sunday and having that be 50% of our diet for weeks and months and months on end. But really changing it up each time you make a large dish so that you're getting some variety and also some interest, you know, different flavors, different combinations of vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, uh, amino acids and different proteins. We need diversity in our diet, but it's okay if that diversity is over a longer window of time rather than every single meal. How about... Does that uh, answer your question? Yes, it does. And in doing that, that brings up my next question. Uh, so you make okay. three meals and now you're going to store them. What's the, what's the best way to store your foods? That is a great question. Uh, first of all, it's very important to make sure that your food cools before you store it. Uh, I'm a big believer of storing things in glass. 
Um, you can invest in a set of Pyrex dishes with lids that minus dropping them will last forever. Um, they're inert. Um, they uh, aren't going to put any chemicals back into the food. You can microwave in them if you wish. Um, and um, they, you can be reassured that they're clean. You can actually get them thoroughly clean. So I like storing in glass. But you want to let the food cool before you store it to avoid trapping too much condensation in the container and making your food soggy. I also want to address the fact that uh, some people are really skittish about bacteria in food. Uh, I, I worked with this family one time where the the, the mom was so well-meaning, but she would prepare a meal. And even before she served it to her family, she was thinking, I've got to package it right away and get it into the fridge or it's going to be attacked with microbes. And that's just not the way biochemistry works. It takes a long time. Um, relatively speaking, for the food to cool to the right kind of temperature that really attracts a lot of bacteria. So it's perfectly fine to go sit down, enjoy your meal, and then you know, within a, an hour or two at most of when you prepared it, packaging up the leftovers and putting them in the fridge. It does not need to be immediate. Um, it, can, it can be a little while. And similarly, um, food in the fridge will stay uh, quite edible um, and retain um, some good nutrients for a good two, three, four days afterward. If you're going to save leftovers um, and you're doing something like, say, a stir fry, I do recommend undercooking it a little bit so that in the process of reheating it later, it's not going to get all soggy and, and mm -hmm. yucky um, so that um, you'll enjoy it multiple times around. But I also, I think it's important that when people go to take out a container of the fridge and open the cover and go to scoop it out and put it on a plate, it's very important to use a clean spoon. And I see this all the time. People will open one container, scoop it out, put it on the plate and look at it and think, yum, and they lick the spoon. And then they put the container back and then they grab another container and they take that spoon that they just licked and scoop up something else and put that on their plate as well. And then they probably lick the spoon and keep going to have a nice varied meal of leftovers. You don't have a video. Of, you don't have a video of me licking. in my house, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you were just making my as stomach turn. That might be. Yes, I know. So many people do this, and it seems quite innocuous, right? It's your own home. It's fine. But the problem is the licking of the spoon is transferring an astounding array of bacteria from your mouth into the food, and it's also taking. Um, microbes from dish to dish. And so your leftover stir fry that probably would have been fine for a couple more days in the fridge, 10 to 1 when you open it tomorrow, is going to have a nice visible coating of mold on it, uh, courtesy mm. of your licking. So use a clean spoon to serve leftovers. And if you're gonna if you're gonna pick from a couple of different containers, use a clean spoon for each of them. That will really help to prolong the life of your leftovers. Uh, and as yourself. fun as it is, mm, yeah. yes, and yourself. Uh, as fun as it is, I don't recommend drinking straight out of cartons or jars or bottles. Um, from the fridge when they're when they're large size and intended to be poured from, and you want to be careful of the dirty spoon because it'll get you. <laughs> yeah, oh, they'll here. bite you back, silly. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question on storage. Back to storage a little bit. I go into the stores and I see you know whole rows of Ziploc baggies, storage, freezer storage, plastic bags that will store your food, keep it fresh. All this. What's your thoughts on all of those? Well, I think plastic can be very convenient um, for people um, if they need that kind of a quickie solution. I, I think, again, I think glass is ideal just because it's inert, it's long lasting, and in the end, it'll save you a ton of money. But if people need something more lightweight or um, unbreakable for some foods, um, the most important thing around plastic is for the food to be cold when you put it in it and you do not want to microwave in plastic. And this is where my background comes in. It is not true that when you put food in a plastic bag and you microwave it, that the plastic is not outgassing. That is not physically possible. The plastic is absolutely outgassing. 
So you do not want to microwave things in plastic bags. And similarly, you don't want to put hot food in a plastic bag and seal it up and risk having um, chemicals diffusing into your food um, for for putting room temperature food in and then putting in cold um, storage or into the freezer, I think it's fine as a solution um, just for convenience. But be very cautious about hot foods. And please, please, please do not microwave in plastic. Even if the bag says it's okay, it's not. It's just not. And it's much better to put them into a glass container, put a paper towel over the top, and microwave it if you're going to microwave, knowing that you're not um, putting chemicals back into the food. Now, what about... That's uh, definitely um, um, uh, a misnomer that a lot of people, or a myth that a lot of people follow because bags say it's okay. And like I said before, what's on the front of food packaging is not necessarily true. It might be enticing, but it's not necessarily true. Um, Tracy, uh, that brings me to a point where now they're coming out with, instead of the plastic covers uh, for microwaving purposes, now they've come out with a silicone covers. Is there a difference? There is a difference. There is a difference. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn actually about the wear and tear on silicone over time. Technically, um, when exposed to heat, silicone is inert. In fact, you cannot find all sorts of um, silicone muffin pans and uh, cake pans or, or baking dishes. Uh, many people are shocked to find out when you take this kind of thin, rubbery, flexible thing and you put it in the oven on 350 degrees mm -hmm. that it doesn't melt. Um, in, in principle, uh, it is inert with the heat. I've seen a couple of studies, and this is why I think we need more research. I've seen a couple of studies um, with some caution about... Um, putting very greasy or oily foods in contact with that because um, some chemicals are much more fat soluble than water soluble. And there's a question about whether or not um, the contact with the really uh, hot oil um, would actually cause some chemical diffusion. Excuse me, but I think based on initial research um, and, and my view of what we know so far, um, I think the silicone is safe. Um, actually, um, it's been in use for a while in uh, spatulas. We call them rubber spatulas that we use to cook mm -hmm. in a um, on the stove, but they're not actually rubber. They're silicone, and it's why you can leave it resting in a stir fry pan and it doesn't melt. Um, versus if you use an actual rubber spatula, it will melt and become a sauce for your right. stir fry pretty quickly. You know, it, it's very interesting because because I bake and I, I cook a lot. Um, I have noticed even some spatulas that say that they are silicone, unless it's labeled that it can handle up to a certain degree in temperature, mm -hmm. I will not use it in hot cooking. I would just use it specifically for baking because if it's not labeled as such, I feel like there might be other rubber or plastics mixed in possibly. I don't know because I'm yes. not in the science world, but um, you know, the ones are that are for cooking or heating, it specifies to what degree that it is safe to. And they're the yes. ones that have no specifications. And that, you know, when they're coming from China, it gives me a little bit, I get a little leery <laughs> what might be mixed well, in. Well, and I, I, yeah, I think your precaution is well merited because even to Glenn's point before, um, we don't have that kind of restriction in terms of hidden ingredients, even in food. So we're certainly not going to have it in utensils. Um, I, I think in general, when we're talking about things, again, that we use on a daily basis for the vast majority of our food prep, I, I think prudence is merited. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's a great precaution. Uh, mm -hmm. When you're not sure, better to err on the side of um, certainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. We could go on and on. <laughs> we are. And for our next show. <laughs> Actually, we're going to talk about our next show in a few minutes. But before that, I want to mention everyone, we are speaking with Tracy Harrison, who is a health and wellness counselor, and she teaches about eating with purpose. And as you know by now, Tracy, this is coming to the time where we want our really special health tip. And I think the bar is getting <laughs> higher and higher for you each time. So do you have something for us? I do. Um, so going back to our discussion about genetically modified foods, I get a lot of questions from people about um, if um, 
if I'm going out and I'm buying as much organic as I can afford, and maybe that's not very much given my food budget, um, and um, where do I need to be the most cautious about genetically modified foods? And, and I think there are two examples um, that if, if folks can follow this, they will go a long, long way of making sure that they don't have uh, GMOs in their diet. Corn and soy are um, the two most prevalent um, genetically modified foods in our common food um, regimen uh, diet. And, and so trying to make sure that when you purchase um, corn type foods, so say corn chips, that's a place where it would make sense for you to spend the 10 or 15 cents more to get organic corn chips rather than non-organic ones. Because not only are you not getting the pesticides then, but the organic standard is making sure you're not getting the genetically modified corn. And I think this is really particularly important for um, families with children because um, different types of immune system dysfunction or um, over the overwrought nature of immune systems is incredibly common in the current generation of children, especially of elementary and middle school age. So when you're purchasing corn type products, look for organic. When you're purchasing soy based products, like maybe soy milk um, or tofu or tempeh, look for organic. Um, again, the organic standard excludes, in principle, any genetically modified ingredients. And given that upwards of 90% of all corn and soy raised in the United States is genetically modified, I think those are two food areas where you want to be cautious. And by paying attention to those, you can do a good job of really making sure that that core 90% of your diet doesn't include GMOs. That's a great tip, Tracy. And just to reiterate, before you said if something has a number on it that's a four, it means inorganic or not organic. And if it has a nine in the number at the beginning of the long number, then it has the possibility for being organic. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, and you really want to check because there are a lot of stores, unfortunately, where the label on the bin will say organic, but you want to check what actually made it in the bin. Because it's not necessarily organic produce. Yeah. And speaking of uh, our next show, Christina, uh, Tracy and I have decided, you know, we've, we've talked about nutrition and we've talked about uh, the gastrointestinal tract. And today we talked about getting foods from the fields to the, to the mouth. For our last show, we have decided that we want to talk about special diets for people. So we're going to be looking at people with certain types of illnesses, or maybe they had a certain type of surgery that requires certain foods. So we want to talk about some specific diets for people. And if any of our audience uh, before we have the show, which will be in July, if any of you have a specific illness and you're concerned about types of diet, you might want to write in to us and suggest something, and maybe we can include that in our discussion. Mm, Tracy, uh, we're so thankful for you being here. I want to thank you again for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. It's been another great show. I also want to thank my healers and teachers for allowing me to be on my journey. And Christina, of course, and the uh, Yoga Hub staff uh, working to make this uh, a great show for all of our viewers. So until next uh, week, we will be looking forward to being in another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. And until that time, I wish you all optimal health. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Yes, thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Glenn. Christina, it was fun. Oh, yes. It. Thank you so much again and again, Tracy. I think our community is uh, lapping all this up, and we have got so much more to go. I mean, <laughs> it's we never do. enough. <laughs> Oh. There's so much. It's incredibly rich. It's um, it's really my pleasure to. Um, and Glenn, I have to co congratulate you on the format of this. I I really love the idea of giving people small, tangible, practical uh, things that they can really run with right away. That's yes. that's a great service. It's awesome. Yes. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. And it, but I have to tell you that it it's not easy because I know when I speak with all of our guests and you included, and it's so obvious, you have so much information to give us. And it's so tempting to be able to just speak about any one topic and go off on it. <laughs> uh, you know, we could, we could, for example, have one on uh, 
banana splits. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite treat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my. Oh, thank you so much, Tracy. And of course, uh, Dr. Glenn Woolman. It's been a magnificent journey. And of course, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We are always grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 1030 a.m. Pacific, 130 p.m. Eastern. Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. And I'd like to remind you that you can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman by following him on Twitter, at Glenn Woolman, and of course through his own website, glennwoolman.com, where we encourage you to learn about his metaphor, Square Breath. We're always grateful for your feedback. And uh, to share it, please call us at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK. Thank you very much, and until we meet again, namaste. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, Christina, a tip that I meant to give that I'll share now, I'm sure there's a few people listening. Um, have you ever seen in the store something called green bags? Yes. Okay. Those work really well. Um, they're these little thin, uh, translucent, um, green, they're usually green. Sometimes yes. they're yellow bags that you can put one type of produce in and put the bag in the, um, the drawer, the produce drawer in your refrigerator, and it will extend the life, the shelf life of the produce, in my experience, like 3X, 300%. Right. And it's because there's no chemicals on the bag, but they, excuse me, the bag has these little bitty pores that allow gases to escape and the, to protect the food from the gases while um, it's in your refrigerator. Because what happens is once the, um, once the, the produce starts to rot or to, to over-ripen, it's sending out gases. And in your refrigerator drawer, those gases get trapped and accelerate the ripening and then the rotting process. So the little bags are a really wonderful trick mm. for not, not, not mucking with anything chemically, right. um, but just separating the gas from the food so that it's not as vulnerable. Yes. And especially for foods like dark leafy greens, like kale or collard greens, I find it's wonderful for keeping them from going bad so quickly. Yes, yes, exactly. Sense of life. I think that um, I've been using those bags for like 10 years, I think. <laughs> but yeah. um, I uh, also, with those big leafy greens, um, the Chinese would put them in paper bags so that the paper breathes. It's like mushrooms. You keep them in the paper bag so it absorbs the any kind of moisture at the same time, and yet it continues mm -hmm. to breathe, and it automatically extends the shelf life for a mm -hmm. lot longer, but not like the green plastic. The green plastic is uh, pretty magnificent. <laughs> and sometimes we do meditations in the water in Bimini, and, and by the time we get in the water, it would, it, it's almost as if it was just a magnet for dolphins. Wow. And uh, I mean, we'd be in there with all of us in a circle with our heads together, and Rebecca would be at my feet, and all of a sudden out of the blue here would come a whole school of dolphins aiming right at us. and going underneath us, jumping through the middle. I mean, it was just, uh, every time I've been to Bimini with Rebecca, it's been incredible.